Stories from the Way of the Sufi by Idris Shah This, too, will pass. A powerful king, ruler of many domains, was in a position of such magnificence that wise men were his mere employees. And yet one day he felt himself confused and called the sages to him. He said, I do not know the cause, but something impels me to seek a certain ring, one that will enable me to stabilize my state. I must have such a ring, and this ring must be one which, when I am unhappy, will make me joyful. At the same time, if I am happy and look upon it, I must be made sad. The wise men consulted one another and threw themselves into deep contemplation. And finally, they came to a decision as to the character of this ring which would suit their king. The ring which they devised was one upon which was inscribed the legend, This too will pass. An Answer of Jesus Some Israelites reviled Jesus one day as he was walking through their part of town, but he answered by repeating prayers in their name. Someone said to him, You prayed for these men. Did you not feel incensed against them? He answered, I could spend only of what I had in my purse. The Horrid Dib-Dib one night, a thief, intending to rob an old woman, crept to the open window of her home and listened. She was lying on the bed, and the thief heard her talking with powerful emotion in a most strange manner. She was saying, Ah! The dib-dib! The horrid dib-dib! This abominable dib-dib will be the end of me! The thief thought, This unfortunate woman is suffering from some terrible disease, the malignant dib-dib of which I've not even heard before. Then, as her wails increased in volume, he began to say to himself, Have I, I wonder, been infected? After all, I almost took her breath as I leant in through the window. The more he thought about it, the more he began to fear that he had indeed contracted the injurious dib-dib. Within a few moments he was shaking in every limb. He only just managed to totter home to his wife, moaning and groaning. The sinister dib-dib! How can there be any doubt that the accursed dib-dib has got me in its grip? His wife put him to bed at once, greatly fearful. What dreadful thing had attacked her husband? She imagined at first that he must have been pounced on by some wild animal called the dib-dib. But as he became less and less coherent, and she still could find no mark upon him, she began to fear that it was a matter of supernatural intervention. The person whom she knew to be best qualified to deal with such a problem was, of course, the local holy man. He was something approaching a priest, learned in the law, known as the sage Faki. The woman immediately went to the house of the sage and begged him to come to see her husband. The Faki, thinking that this might indeed be a field in which his especial sanctity could be put to use, hurried to the thief's bedside. The thief, when he saw the man of faith beside him, thought that his end must be even closer than he had feared. Mastering all his strength, he muttered, The, the old woman at the end of the road, she has the accursed dib-dib, and it has flown upon me from her. Help me if you can, Reverend Faki. My son, said the Faki, although he was himself perplexed, bethink yourself of repentance and pray for mercy, for your remaining hours may now indeed be few. He left the thief and made his way to the old woman's cottage. Peering through the window, he distinctly heard her whimpering voice as she writhed and shuddered. Foul dib-dib, you're killing me! Stop, stop, evil dib-dib, for you're sapping my very lifeblood away! And she continued for some time in this vein, occasionally sobbing and sometimes remaining silent. The Faki himself now began to feel as if an eerie chill had passed through him. He started to shake and his hands clutching the window frame caused it to rattle like the chattering of teeth. At this sound, the crone leapt from her bed and seized the now terrified Faki by the hands. What are you, a man of respectability and learning, doing at this time of night, looking through decent people's windows? She shrilled. 
Good but unfortunate woman, faltered the learned one. I heard you speak of the awful dib-dib, and I now fear that it has its clutches upon my heart as well as upon your own, and, and, and that I am physically and spiritually lost. You incredible fool, screeched the hag, to think that for all these years I've been looking up to you as a man of books and wisdom. You hear someone say dib-dib and you imagine that it's going to kill you? Look then in yonder corner and see what this appalling dib-dib really is. And she pointed to the dripping tap which the Faki suddenly realised was leaking with the thud of dib, dib, dib. But divines have their resilience, and in next to no time he felt himself marvellously restored by the relief from his troubles and hurried back to the house of the thief, for he had work to do. Go away, groaned the thief, for you deserted me in my necessity, and the sight of so depressing a face offers little reassurance as to my future state. The elder interrupted him. Ungrateful wretch, do you think that a man of my piety and learning would leave a matter such as this unsolved? Attend then closely to my words and acts, and I shall show you how I worked untiringly in accordance with my celestial mandate towards your safety and recovery. The word recovery immediately focused the attention of both the thief and his wife upon the imposing dignity of that reputed sage. He took some water and said certain words over it. Then he made the thief promise never to steal again. Finally, he sprinkled the prepared water over the thief with many a polysyllabic word and gesture, ending with, Flee, unclean and infernal dib-dib, whence thou camest, never returning to plague this unhappy man. The thief sat up, cured. From that day to this, the thief has never stolen again. Neither has he told anyone about the miraculous cure, because in spite of everything, he still does not much like the sage and his ideas. And the old woman, normally a gossip, has not spread the word of the idiocy of the Faki. She plans eventually to turn it to good account. Some occasion will arise for a bartering of good turns, perhaps. And of course the Faki, well, the Faki is not of a mind to have the details bruited about and he will not recite the tale either. But, as is the way of men, each of the people involved has told his or her own version, in strict confidence, of course, to one other person. And that is why you have been able to know the whole story of the woman, the thief, the priest, and the terrible Dib-Dib. Three Visits to a Sage Bahadin Naqshband was visited by a group of seekers. They found him in his courtyard, surrounded by disciples, in the midst of what obviously seemed to be revels. Some of the newcomers said, How obnoxious! This is no way to behave, whatever the pretext. They tried to remonstrate with the master. Others said, This seems to us excellent. We like this kind of teaching and wish to take part in it. Yet others said, we are partly perplexed and wish to know more about this puzzle. The remainder said to one another, There may be some wisdom in this, but whether we should ask about it or not, we do not know. The teacher sent them all away. And all these people spread, in conversation and in writing, their opinions of the occasion. Even those who did not allude to their experience directly were affected by it, and their speech and works reflected their beliefs about it. Some time later, certain members of this party again passed that way. They called upon the teacher. Standing at his door, they noticed that within the courtyard he and his disciples now sat decorously, deep in contemplation. This is better, said some of the visitors, for he has evidently learned from our protests. This is excellent, said others, for last time he was undoubtedly only testing us. This is too sombre, said others, for we could have found long faces anywhere. And there were other opinions voiced and otherwise. The sage, when the time of reflection was over, sent all these visitors away. Much later, a small number returned and sought his interpretation of what they had experienced. They presented themselves at the gateway and looked into the courtyard. The teacher sat there alone, 
neither reveling nor in meditation. His disciples were now nowhere to be seen. You may at last hear the whole story, he said, for I have been able to dismiss my pupils since the task is done. When you first came, that class of mine had been too serious. I was in process of applying the corrective. The second time you came, they had been too gay. I was applying the corrective. When a man is working, he does not always explain himself to casual visitors, however interested the visitors might think themselves to be. When an action is in progress, what counts is the correct operation of that action. Under these circumstances, external evaluation becomes a secondary concern. The Magic Box A man once wanted to sell a rough carpet, and he made a public offer of it in the street. The first man to whom he showed it said, This is a coarse carpet and very worn, and he bought it cheaply. Then the buyer stood up and said to another who was walking along, Here is a carpet soft as silk, none is like it. A Sufi who was passing by had listened to the buying and the attempted selling of one and the same carpet with two different descriptions. The Sufi said to the carpet seller, Please, carpet man, put me in your magic box, which can turn a rough carpet into a smooth one, perhaps a nothing into a jewel. On entering, living in, and leaving the world. Man, you enter the world reluctantly, crying as a forlorn babe. Man, you leave this life, deprived again, crying again, with regret. Therefore, live this life in such a way that none of it is really wasted. You have to become accustomed to it after not having been accustomed to it. When you have become accustomed to it, you will have to become used to being without it. Meditate upon this contention. Die, therefore, before you die, in the words of the purified one. Complete the circle before it is completed for you. Until you do, unless you have, then expect bitterness at the end as there was in the beginning in the middle, as there will be at the end. You did not see the pattern as you entered, and when you entered, you saw another pattern. When you saw this apparent pattern, you were prevented from seeing the threads of the coming pattern. Until you see both, you will be without contentment. Whom do you blame, and why? Do you blame? My Lady Fatima and the Animals There was once a small girl who grew up with her parents all alone in a forest. One day she found that her father and mother were dead and she would have to fend for herself. Her parents had left behind a mirab, a strange carved ornament like a window frame, which they kept hung on a wall of their hut. Since I am alone now, said Fatima, and shall have to survive in this forest where the living things are only animals, it would be best if I could talk to them and understand their speech. So she spent a good part of her day addressing this aspiration to the frame on the wall. Mirab, give me the power to understand animals and to speak with them. After a long time, she suddenly had the impression that she would be able to communicate with birds, animals, even fish so she went to the woods to try. Soon she came to a pool. On the top of the pool was a pond fly which skipped about on the surface and never entered the water. Swimming in the water were several fish, and stuck to the bottom of the pond were some snails. Fatima said, in order to start conversation, Fly, why do you not enter the water? Why should I, supposing that that were possible, which it is not? asked the fly. "'Because you would be safe from the birds which swoop down and eat you.' "'I haven't been eaten yet, have I?' said the fly. "'And that was the end of the conversation. "'Then Fatima spoke to the fish. "'Fish!' she said to it through the water. 
Why do you not find out how to get out of the water, little by little? I have heard that some fish can do this. Absolutely impossible, said the fish. Nobody has done that and survived. We are brought up to believe that it is both a sin and a mortal danger. And he turned back and dived into the shadows, unwilling to hear such nonsense. So she called down to the snail. Snail, you could crawl out of the water and find nice herbs to eat. I have heard that snails can really do that. A question is best answered by a question when a wise snail hears it, said the snail. Perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me exactly why you have so much interest in my welfare. People should look after themselves. Well, said Fatima, I suppose it is because when a person can see more about another person, he wants to help him to attain greater heights. That seems a strange idea to me, said the snail, and crawled out of earshot under a rock. Fatima gave up the fly, the fish, and the snail, and wandered on into the forest looking for something else to talk to. She felt that she must be able to be of use to someone. After all, she had much more knowledge than these forest folk. A bird, she thought, for example, could be warned to store food for the winter or to nest near the warmth of a hut so that it would not die unnecessarily. But she did not see a bird. Instead, she came across the hut of a charcoal burner. He was an old man, and he sat in front of his door, burning charcoal to take to the market. Fatima, delighted at seeing another human being, the only one other than her parents whom she had met, ran up to him. She told him her experiences of that day. Don't worry about that, child, said the kindly old man. There are things which a human being has to learn, and those things are of vital importance to his future. Things to learn, said Fatima. And what should I want with things to learn, pray? They would only most probably change my way of life and thinking. And like the fly, the fish, and the snail, she moved away out of contact with the charcoal burner. Fatima, daughter of Walia, spent another thirty years like the fly, the fish, and the snail, before she learnt anything at all. Why I did that? One day a man came to the great teacher Bahadin. He asked for help in his problems and guidance on the path of the teaching. Bahadin told him to abandon spiritual studies and to leave his court at once. A kind-hearted visitor began to remonstrate with Bahadin. You shall have a demonstration, said the sage. At that moment a bird flew into the room, darting hither and thither, not knowing where to go in order to escape. The Sufi waited until the bird settled near the only open window of the chamber and then suddenly clapped his hands. Alarmed, the bird flew straight through the opening of the window to freedom. To him, that sound must have been something of a shock, even an affront. Do you not agree? said Bahadin. The test. It is related of Shakik of Balkh that he once said to his disciples, I put my confidence in God and went through the wilderness with only a small coin in my pocket. I went on the pilgrimage and came back, and the coin is still with me. One of the youths stood up and said to Shakik, If you had a coin in your pocket, how could you say that you relied upon anything higher? Shakik answered, there is nothing for me to say, for this young man is right. When you rely upon the invisible world, there is no place for anything, however small, as a provision. The Seven Brothers Once upon a time there was a wise father who had seven sons. While they were growing up, he taught them as much as he could, but before he could complete their education, he perceived something which made their safety more important. He realized that a catastrophe was going to overwhelm their country. The young men were foolhardy, and he could not confide completely in them. He knew that if he said, a catastrophe threatens, they would say, we will stay here with you and face it. So he told each son that he must undertake a mission. 
and that he was to leave for that mission forthwith. He sent the first to the north, the second to the south, the third to the west, and the fourth to the east. The three other sons he sent to unknown destinations. As soon as they had gone, the father, using his special knowledge, made his way to a distant country to carry on some work, which had been interrupted by the need to educate his sons. When they had completed their missions, the first four sons returned to their country. The father had so timed the duration of their tasks that they would be safely and remotely engaged upon them until it was possible to return home. In accordance with their instructions, the sons went back to the place which they had known in their youth. But now they did not know one another. Each claimed that he was the son of his father. Each one refused to believe the others. Time and climate, sorrow and indulgence had done their work, and the appearance of the men was changed. Because they were so bitterly opposed to one another, and each determined to assess the other by his stature, his beard, the colour of his skin, and his manner of speech, all of which had changed, no brother would for months allow another to open the letter from their common father, which contained the answer to their problem and the remainder of their education. The father had foreseen this, such was his wisdom. He knew that until they were able to understand that they had changed very much, they would not be able to learn any more. The situation at present is that two of the sons have recognized one another, but only tentatively. They have opened the letter. They are trying to adjust themselves to the fact that what they took to be fundamentals are really, in the form in which they use them, worthless externals. What they have for many years prized as the very roots of their importance may in reality be vain and now useless dreams. The two other brothers, watching them, are not satisfied that they are being improved by their experience and do not want to emulate them. The three brothers who went in the other directions have not yet arrived at the rendezvous. As to the four, it will be some time before they truly realize that the only means of their survival in their exiles, the superficials which they think important, are the very barriers to their understanding. All are still far from knowledge. Problems of Generosity A student, going to pay his respects to a Sufi, asked him, out of curiosity, Why are those thirty magnificent Hirat mules standing in your courtyard? The sage immediately said, They are there for you. The student was delighted when he heard that they were being given to him, although he said, I should pay some price, surely. The price, said the master, may be more than you can pay by yourself, but the condition is that you tell nobody that I gave the mules to you. I am not here to be known as good among men because of such actions. People in general think that something is good because of an action whose consequences and origin they cannot grasp. Nothing seems smaller than your price, said the student. He led the mules away in rapture, saying to himself, My teacher has indeed benefited me. This is the outer manifestation of an interior blessing. Soon evening fell. And within a few moments, the student fell into the hands of the night patrol. Its members said one to another, Let us accuse this man of such and such a crime, which we cannot in any case solve. We can suggest that he bought the mules with the profits of a theft, unless he can account for their possession otherwise. He's probably guilty of something, being ill-nurtured and poorly dressed. Some of us have seen him before, and believe in any case that he has associates of doubtful character. Taken before the summary court, the student at first refused to answer any questions about the origin of the mules. The examining magistrate ordered that he be put to the bastinado. In the meantime, another body of disciples were attending the sage, who sent them in relays to follow the fortunes of the first man. They reported from time to time, he refuses to talk, and he is weakening, they are torturing him. At length the Sufi stood up, and made haste to the court. On his testimony that he had given the man the mules, the prisoner was released. Then he addressed the court, his disciples, and the public 
who were perplexed at this event, thus. The repute of generosity has three evils. It can corrode the man who has this repute. It can harm the man who admires this generosity if he imitates it ignorantly. It can erode whoever receives generosity if he knows the giver. There should be no sense of obligation. That is why it is incumbent upon the Sufi to exercise generosity with complete secrecy. The highest form of generosity known to the ordinary man is equal to the lowest level of real generosity. It was originally instituted as a way of introducing man to liberality. It has become an idol and a curse. The Miser and the Angel of Death. A miser had accumulated by effort, trade and lending 300,000 dinars. He had lands and buildings and all kinds of wealth. He then decided that he'd spend a year in enjoyment, living comfortably, and then decide as to what his future should be. But almost as soon as he had stopped amassing money, the angel of death appeared before him to take his life away. The miser tried by every argument which he could muster to dissuade the angel, who seemed, however, adamant. Then the man said, Grant me but three more days, and I will give you one-third of my possessions. The angel refused and pulled again at the miser's life, tugging to take it away. Then the man said, If you will only allow me two more days on earth, I will give you 200,000 dinars from my store. But the angel would not listen to him. The angel even refused to give the man a solitary extra day for all his 300,000 pieces. Then the miser said, Please, then, give me just time enough to write one little thing down. This time the angel allowed him the single concession, and the man wrote with his own blood, Man, make use of your life. I could not buy one hour for 300,000 dinars. Make sure that you realise the value of your time. The Tale of Fazl Rabbi One day a penurious old man went to see Fazl Rabbi to discuss some matter or other. Because of weakness and nervousness, this ancient stuck the iron point of his walking stick into Fazl Rabbi's foot. Listening courteously to what the old man had to say, Fazl Rabbi said no word, though he went pale and then flushed from the pain of the wound and the iron as it stayed lodged in his foot. Then, when the other had finished his business, he took a paper from him and put his signature to it. When the old man had gone, delighted that he had been successful in his application, Fazl Rabbi allowed himself to collapse. One of the attendant nobles said, My lord, you sat there with blood pouring from your foot, with that old man in his dotage piercing it with his iron-tipped staff, and you said nothing, nothing at all. Fazl Rabbi answered, I made no sign of pain because I feared that the old man's distress might cause him to withdraw in confusion and that he might abandon his application for my help. Poor as he was, how could I add to his troubles in that manner? Be a real man. Learn nobility of thought and action like that of Fazl Rabbi. The Perception of the Madman there was a certain madman who would not take part in congregational prayers. One Friday, after much difficulty, people induced him to attend. But as soon as the leader of the prayer started to recite, the madman started to bellow like an ox. The people, assuming that he was only reverting to madness, but at the same time desirous of helping him, challenged him afterwards. Have you no idea of God that you should make a noise like an animal in the middle of a believing congregation? But the madman said, I was only doing what the prayer leader was doing. When he intoned, he was buying an ox, and I spoke like an ox. 
When this strange remark was reported to the leader of the prayer, he confessed, When I was saying God is greatest of all, I was in fact thinking about my farm. And when I got to the phrase, praise to God, I thought that I would buy an ox. It was at that moment that I heard something bellowing. Miracles and Tricks Bahaudin once received a mendicant calendar who offered to perform miracles to prove that he was a representative of the greatest of all mystical masters. El Shah said, We are here in Bukhara, the unique community whose faith is neither produced nor sustained in the smallest particular by extraordinary happenings called miracles. But it is of value for you to perform before the whole assembly of dervishes and also those who come to see us. He accordingly arranged for the next festival day to be set aside for the performance of the strange calendar. For a whole day, the mendicant performed miracle after miracle. He brought the dead to life, he walked on water, he caused a severed head to speak, and many other wonders. The Bukharans were in an uproar. Some of them stated that this man must be a disciple of the devil, for they did not want to adopt his way of life or to credit him with any beneficent powers. Some of the peripheral supporters of El Shah declared themselves satisfied that a new sun had arisen and tried to make arrangements to leave for wherever his monastery might be. Some of the newer disciples of El Shah begged him to perform similar miracles to show that he was capable of them. Bahaudin did nothing for three days. Then, before an immense concourse of people, he started to perform what can only be called miracles. One after another, people saw things which they could hardly believe. They saw, heard and touched such things as were not even imagined in the traditions about the wonders of the greatest saints of all time. Then, Bahaudin, one after another, showed them how the tricks were carried out, and that they were tricks. Those of you who are seekers of juggling, follow the way of juggling, he said, for I am at more serious work. Do more than laugh at fools. Once upon a time there was a fool who was sent to buy flour and salt. He took a dish to carry his purchases. Make sure, said the man who sent him, not to mix the two things. I want them separate. When the shopkeeper had filled the dish with flour and was measuring out the salt, the fool said, Do not mix it with the flour. Here, I will show you where to put it. And he inverted the dish to provide from its upturned bottom a surface upon which the salt could be laid. The flour, of course, fell on the floor. But the salt was safe. When the fool got back to the man who had sent him, he said, Here is the salt. Very well, said the other man, but where is the flour? It should be here, said the fool, turning the dish over. As soon as he did that, the salt fell to the ground, and the flour, of course, was seen to be gone. So it is with human beings. Doing one thing which they think to be right they may undo another which is equally right. When this happens with thoughts instead of actions, man himself is lost, no matter how, upon reflection, he regards his thinking to have been logical. You have laughed at the joke of the fool. Now will you do more, and think about your own thoughts as if they were the salt and the flower. A Story of Moses once Moses was asking God to show him one of God's friends, and a voice answered, Go to a certain valley, and there you will find one who loves, one of the chosen who treads the path. Moses went and found this man, dressed in rags, plagued by every kind of insect and crawling thing. He said, Can I do anything for you? The man answered, Emissary of God! Bring me a cup of water, for I am thirsty. 
When Moses returned with the water, he found the man lying dead. He went away to look for a piece of cloth for a winding sheet. When he came back, he found that the body had been all but devoured by a desert lion. Moses was distressed beyond measure and cried out, All powerful and all knowing one, you convert mud into human beings. Some are carried to paradise, others driven through tortures. One is happy, another in misery. This is the paradox which none can understand. Then an inner voice spoke to Moses, saying, This man had relied upon us for drink and then turned back from that trust. He relied upon Moses for his sustenance, trusting in an intermediary. His was the fault in asking for help from another after having been content with us. Your heart attaches itself again and again to objects. You have to know how to keep the connection with your origins. The Oath A man who was troubled in mind once swore that if his problems were solved he would sell his house and give all the money gained from it to the poor. The time came when he realized that he must redeem his oath, but he did not want to give away so much money, so he thought of a way out. He put the house on sale at one silver piece. Included with the house, however, was a cat. The price asked for this animal was ten thousand pieces of silver. Another man bought the house and the cat. The first man gave the single piece of silver to the poor and pocketed the ten thousand for himself. Many people's minds work like this. They resolve to follow a teaching, but they interpret their relationship with it to their own advantage. The Vine A certain man planted a vine, well known as being of a kind which produces eatable grapes only after thirty years. It so happened that as he was planting it, the commander of the faithful passed by, paused and said, you are a remarkable optimist if you hope to live until that kind of vine bears fruit. Perhaps I shall not, said the man, but at least my successors will live to benefit from my work, as we all profit from the work of our predecessors. In any case, said the ruler, if and when any grapes are produced, bring some of them to me. That is, if both of us have escaped the sword of death which is hanging over us all the time. He went on his way. Some years later, the vine started to bear delicious grapes. The man filled a large basket with the choicest bunches and went to the palace. The commander of the faithful received him and gave him a handsome present of gold. The word went round. An insignificant peasant has been given a huge sum in exchange for a basket of grapes. A certain ignorant woman, hearing this, immediately filled a basket with her own grapes and presented herself to the palace guard, saying, I demand the same recompense as the man who was rewarded this morning. Here is my fruit. If the king gives money for fruit, here is fruit. Word was taken to the commander of the faithful, whose answer was, Those who act by imitation and the arrogance which underlies the lack of inquiry into the circumstances which they try to imitate. Let them be driven away. The woman was sent away, but she was so annoyed that she did not trouble herself to ask the vine grower what had really happened. The Watermelon Hunter Once upon a time there was a man who strayed from his own country into the world known as the Land of Fools. He soon saw a number of people flying in terror from a field where they had been trying to reap wheat. There is a monster in that field, they told him. He looked and saw that it was a watermelon. He offered to kill the monster for them. When he had cut the melon from its stalk, he took a slice and began to eat it. The people became even more terrified of him than they had been of the melon. They drove him away with pitchforks, crying, He will kill us next unless we get rid of him. It so happened that at another time, another man also strayed into the land of fools, and the same thing started to happen to him. 
but instead of offering to help them with the monster, he agreed with them that it must be dangerous, and by tiptoeing away from it with them, he gained their confidence. He spent a long time with them in their houses until he could teach them, little by little, the basic facts which would enable them not only to lose their fear of melons, but even to cultivate them themselves. King Mahmud and the Beans The mighty King Mahmud of Ghazna, out hunting one day, was separated from his party. He came upon the smoke of a small fire and rode to the spot, where he found an old woman with a pot. Mahmud said, You have as guest today the monarch. What are you cooking on your fire? The crone said, This is bean stew. The emperor asked her, Old lady, will you not give me some? I will not, she said, for this is only for me. Your kingdom is not worth what these beans are worth. You may want my beans, but I don't want anything you have. My beans are worth a hundred times more than all you have. Look at your enemies, who challenge your possessions in every particular. I am free, and I have my own beans. The mighty Mahmud looked at the undisputed owner of the beans, thought of his disputed domains, and wept. The Girl Who Came Back From The Dead In ancient times there was a beautiful girl, the daughter of a good man, a woman among women, rare in her loveliness and in the delicacy of her nature. When she was of a marriageable age, three young men, each apparently of the highest rank and of great promise, sought her hand. Having decided that they were of equal merit, the father left the final choice to her. But months passed and the girl did not seem to be making up her mind, and one day she suddenly fell ill. Within a few hours she was dead. The three young men, united in grief, took her body to a cemetery and buried it in the deepest of silent agony. The first youth made the graveyard his home, spending his nights there in sorrow and meditation, unable to understand the workings of the fate which had taken her away. The second youth took to the roads and wandered throughout the world in search of knowledge as a fakir. The third young man spent his time in consoling the bereaved father. Now the youth who had become a fakir in his journeyings came across a certain place where a man of repute in uncanny arts resided. Continuing his search for knowledge, he presented himself at the door and was admitted to the table of the master of the house. When the host invited him to eat, he was about to start the meal when a small child started to cry. It was the grandson of the wise man. The sage picked up the boy and threw him into the fire. The fakir jumped up and started to leave the house, crying out, Infamous demons, I have had my share of sorrows of the world already, but this crime surpasses those of all recorded history. Think nothing of it, said the master of the house, for simple things appear otherwise when there is an absence of knowledge. So saying, he recited a formula and waved a strange emblem, and the boy walked out of the fire unharmed. The fakir memorized the words and the design, and the next morning was on his way back to the cemetery where his beloved was buried. In less time than it takes to tell, the maiden stood before him, fully restored to life. She went back to her father while the youths disputed as to which of them had earned her hand. The first said, I have been living in the graveyard, keeping through my vigils contact with her, guarding her spirit's needs, for earthly support. The second said, You both ignore the fact that it was I who actually travelled the world in search of knowledge and who ultimately brought her back to life. The third said, I have grieved for her, and like a husband and a son-in-law, I have lived here consoling the father and helping with his upkeep. They appealed to the girl herself. She said, He who found the formula to restore me was a humanitarian. He who looked after my father acted as a son to him. He who lay beside my grave, he acted like a lover. I will marry him. <laughs>